but it is painful to observe how the spirit of secession has blotted out the memories of the past and filled their hearts with bitterness toward the friends of the Union. A few Union families in these parts, whose acquaintance we have made, assure us that their neighbors, who were formerly most hospitable and humane, have become, through this rebel virus, incarnate fiends. To secede from the Union was evidently to secede from the God of virtue and charity. April 25th After spending a few days of tolerable quietness on the banks of the Rappahannock, with our camp near the Phillips House, Falmouth, a most lovely spot, we were today ordered out as escort or guard to a train destined for the Shenandoah Valley. Such a job is generally anything but pleasant to a cavalry force, for the movement is altogether too slow, especially when bad roads are encountered. And in case a team becomes bulky or gives out, or a wagon breaks down, incidents which occur frequently, the whole column is in statib quo until the difficulty or disability is removed. And so we are halting, advancing, halting and advancing again, with this monotonous variety repeated ad libitum, while the halts are often longer than the advances. But our slow motion gives us some opportunity to scout the country through which we pass, and to obtain large quantities of rations and forage for man and beast. By this means we are not compelled to consume much, if any, of the contents of our train. On the 28th we reached Thoroughfare Gap, through which the Manassas Gap Railroad finds its way over the Bull Run Mountains. Here we met a force from General Nathaniel P. Banks's army, to whose care we delivered the train. We remained a few days to scout through the country. On the 1st of May we started back toward Falmouth, but stopped several days at Bristersburg, a small town where we spent our time very pleasantly, scouting through the country and living upon its rich products. Here we are very much isolated from the rest of our army. We seldom get a mail or receive any papers, except from rebel sources, and these are so meager of literary taste and especially of reliable army news that we dare not put much trust in their representations. However, we are satisfied from what we read that our grand peninsular army is making some telling demonstrations toward Richmond and that the rebel general Thomas J. Jackson, surnamed Stonewall, since his famous defeat by General James Shields at Kernstown near Winchester, is still in the valley. Sixth, the Harris Light crossed the Rappahannock and advanced six miles beyond Fredericksburg, where we got only a glimpse of some of Field's cavalry, who had not forgotten us. They kept themselves at a very respectful distance from us and made themselves scarce whenever we made signs of an attack. For several days we bivouacked on that side of the river, and on the twelfth we returned to our old camp at Falmouth Heights. On the sixteenth we were again thrown across the river, and made a reconnaissance several miles south, without finding any force of the enemy. Nothing of importance occurred until the 4th of July, when the Troy Company of the Harris Light, commanded by Lieutenant Robert Loudon, was sent out to celebrate this national holiday by a reconnaissance on the Telegraph Road, south of Fredericksburg. We left camp at eight o'clock in the morning, and soon came in sight of a detachment of Bath Cavalry doing patrol duty. After following them for some time, though not rapidly, we halted a few moments and they lost sight of us, concluding doubtless that we had retired. This was just what we wanted. On the south bank of the Po River, about twenty miles from Fredericksburg, was a beautiful orchard, owned by a Dr. Flipper. This lovely spot had been chosen by our bath friends for their outpost, their main reserve being a few miles farther south. On arriving at the orchard with its luscious fruit and inviting shade, the squad we were still pursuing unsuspectingly unsaddled their horses, began to arrange preparations for their dinner, and to make themselves generally comfortable. Of this state of things we were informed by a contraband we chanced to meet. We then resolved either to share or spoil their coffee, so moving forward at a trot until in sight of them, we swooped down upon the orchard like eagles. The surprised and frightened cavaliers fired but a few shots, and we captured twelve men and nine horses, and escaped with our lawful prey without having received a scratch. It was my good fortune to take prisoner Lieutenant Powell, the officer in command, 
and to receive as my own a silver-mounted revolver, which he reluctantly placed in my hand. It will be a fine souvenir of the war, and of this Fourth of July victory to the Troy Company. Sometime in May, Colonel Bayard, with his regiment and a large portion of General McDowell's division, were sent to the Shenandoah Valley to share in the shifting military panorama which was there displayed. With the removal of the Army of the Potomac to the peninsula, the Confederate authorities dispatched General Jackson to the valley to threaten the Upper Potomac and Maryland, thus making it necessary for a large Federal force to remain in this quarter. General Banks was in command of that department. After the Battle of Kernstown, in which Jackson received the sobriquet of Stonewall and a sound thrashing, General Banks, who had set out for Warrenton, returned to the valley and pursued Jackson, but was unable to bring him to bay. The enemy's cavalry under Colonel Turner Ashby was frequently attacked by the Union cavalry under General John P. Hatch. On the 6th of May, the 5th New York Cavalry, 1st Ira Harris Guard, had a hand-to-hand -hand encounter with Ashby's men near Harrisonburg, where Yankee Sabres and Pluck had established a reputation. A portion of the same regiment under Colonel John R. Kenley at Front Royal added new luster to their fame on the 23rd of the same month during Stonewall's flank movement on General Banks at Strasburg and fought bravely during that memorable retreat to Maryland. At this juncture of affairs, a division of General McDowell's forces, under General Shields, was dispatched to the valley to intercept Jackson, while General John C. Fremont was ordered by telegraph to the same scene from the Mountain Department. But unavoidably detained by almost impassable mountain roads and streams enormously swollen by recent rains, Fremont reached Strasburg just in time to see Jackson's last stragglers retreating through the town. His pursuit was very rapid, though no engagement was brought about until the 5th of June at Harrisonburg. Here, Colonel Percy Wyndham, on our side, and Turner Ashby, now a general, on the rebel side, distinguished themselves in the cavalry. Ashby was killed. His loss was greatly lamented by his comrades. He always fought at the head of his men with the most reckless self-exposure and for outpost duty and the skirmish line he left scarcely an equal behind him in either army. His humaneness to our men who had fallen into his hands caused many of them to shed tears at the intelligence of his death. Men of valor and kindness are always worthy of a better cause than that in which the rebels are engaged, but their merit is always appreciated. Upon the heel of this fight followed the battles of Cross Keys and Port Republic, where Jackson eluded the combined Union forces which had been directed against him. During this memorable campaign, a curious military modus operandi had been resorted to in the Luray Valley, in which the cavalry had made itself doubly useful. A small force of our infantry and cavalry were surrounded by the enemy on the south bank of the Shenandoah River, which was so high as to be unfordable. As a last resort, the cavalrymen plunged into the stream, swimming their horses, and towing across the infantrymen who clung to the animals' tails. A striking case of personal daring in this valley campaign is worthy of record here. During Banks' retreat from Winchester on the 24th of May, four companies of the 5th New York Cavalry, under command of Captain Wheeler, were moving on the left flank of our retreating columns to protect them from any attacks by the rebel cavalry, which infested the wooded hills that lay along our route. Emerging from a thick wood, Captain John Hammond, who had the advance with eight or ten men, suddenly came upon a squad of mounted rebels and immediately called on them to surrender. However, they fled, firing as they went, but were closely pursued. Captain Hammond was riding a powerful horse, which he had taken from his home, and as his blood was up, he determined to capture one of the party at least, at all hazards. He soon came up to the hindmost, a strong man, with whom he exchanged several shots at close quarters but without effect on either side, owing to their fearful gait through the timber and down a hill. Hammond's pistol became fouled by a cap, and the cylinder would not revolve. The rebel had two charges left. Quick work was now necessary. Another spurring of his horse brought him within arm's length of the flying rebel, whereupon he seized his coat-collar with both his hands and dragged him backward from his saddle, 
holding firmly his grasp, both horses went from under them, and they fell pell-mell to the ground. Luckily Hammond was uppermost, with one hand at the enemy's throat and the other holding the band of the pistol with which the rebel was trying to shoot him. As the two men were powerful, a fearful struggle ensued for the mastery of the pistol. Meantime up rode one of Hammond's boys, who, by his order, fired at the upturned face of the obstinate foe, the ball grazing his scalp and causing him to relinquish his hold of the revolver when he was forced to surrender. Thus ended one of the roughest yet amusing contests of the war. The prisoner proved to be one of Ashby's scouts, and the remainder of the party were all captured. But notwithstanding the personal bravery of our men, disaster and defeat had attended our operations in the valley. Nor was this the only field of disastrous changes. On the peninsula sieges had been laid and raised, terrible battles fought, won, and lost, and thousands of our brave comrades had succumbed to the impure water and miasmatic condition of the country. The rebel general J. E. B. Stewart had astounded everybody by a raid around our entire army, cutting off communications, destroying stores, and capturing not a few prisoners. On the 2nd of July, this jaded army found a resting place at Harrison's Landing on the James River. Chapter 5. Pope's Campaign in Northern Virginia. Our prospects as a nation were anything but promising about the 4th of July, 1862. Our operations in the Shenandoah Valley had been very expensive and fruitless. The Peninsular Campaign, which promised so much at its beginning, which had proceeded at so fearful a cost of treasure and blood, was pronounced a failure at last, and the great armies, depleted and worn, were well nigh discouraged. The celebration of the anniversary of our national birthday was observed throughout the loyal North in the midst of gloomy forebodings, and only the pure patriotism of governors of states and of the President of the United States gave the people any ground of hope for success. In the army changes of leaders were occurring, which produced no little amount of jealousy among the stars, and upon which the opinion of the rank and file was divided. On the 14th of July, General John Pope, having been called from a glorious career in the West, took command of the Army of Virginia, which was a consolidation of the commands of Fremont, Banks, and McDowell. Before General Pope left Washington, he ordered General Rufus King, who was in command at Fredericksburg, to make a raid on the Virginia Central Railroad, for the purpose of destroying it at as many points as possible, and thus impede communications between Richmond and the Valley. This work was committed to our regiment. At six o'clock in the evening of July 19th, the Harris Light was set in rapid motion almost directly south. By means of a foresaid march of forty miles through the night, at the gray dawn of morning we descended upon Beaver Dam Depot, on the Virginia Central, like so many ravenous wolves upon a broken fold. Here we had some lively work. The command was divided in several squads, and each party was assigned its peculiar and definite duty. So while some were destroying culverts and bridges, others were playing mischief with the telegraph wires. Others still were burning the depot, which was nearly full of stores, and a fourth party was on the lookout. During our affray, we captured a young Confederate officer who gave his name as Captain John S. Mosby. By his sprightly appearance and conversation, he attracted considerable attention. He is slight, yet well-formed, has a keen blue eye and florid complexion, and displays no small amount of southern bravado in his dress and manners. His gray plush hat is surmounted by a waving plume, which he tosses as he speaks in real Prussian style. He had a letter in his possession from General Stuart, recommending him to the kind regards of General Lee. After making general havoc of railroad stock and rebel stores, we started in the direction of Gordonsville, but having ascertained that a force of rebels much larger than our own occupied the place, we turned northward and reached our old camp at midnight, having marched upward of eighty miles in thirty hours. Some of us will not soon forget the ludicrous scenes which were enacted, especially during the latter portion of the raid. In consequence of the jaded condition of our horses, it was necessary to make frequent halts. 
To relieve themselves and animals, when a halt was ordered, some men would dismount, and, sinking to the ground through exhaustion, would quickly fall asleep. With the utmost difficulty they were aroused by their comrades when the column advanced. Calling them by their names, though we did it with mouth to ear and with all our might, made no impression upon them. In many instances we were compelled to take hold of them, roll them over, tumble them about, and pound them, before we could make them realize that the proper time for rest and sleep had not yet come. Others slept in their saddles, either leaning forward on the pommel of the saddle, or on the roll of coat and blanket, or sitting quite erect, with an occasional bow forward or to the right or left, like the swaying of a flag on a signal station, or like the careerings of a drunken man. The horse of such a sleeping man will seldom leave his place in the column, though this will sometimes occur, and the man awakes at last to find himself alone with his horse, which is grazing along some unknown field or woods. Some men, having lost the column in this way, have fallen into the enemy's hands. Sometimes a fast-walking horse in one of the rear companies will bear his sleeping lord quickly along, forcing his way through the ranks ahead of him, until the poor fellow is awakened and finds himself just passing by the colonel and his staff at the head of the column. Of course, he falls back to his old place somewhat confused and ashamed, and the occurrence lends him just excitement enough to keep him awake for a few moments. It is seldom that men under these somnambulic circumstances fall from their horses, yet sometimes it does happen, and headlong goes the cavalier upon the hard ground, or into a splashing mud puddle, while general merriment is produced among the lookers-on. But as no one is seriously injured, the fallen brave retakes his position in the ranks, and the column proceeds as though nothing had happened. We had all these experiences in one form or another in our raid, and on reaching camp found that several men had lost their caps, by the way. The day following our arrival at camp, the general in command issued his complimentary message, namely, Headquarters Army of Virginia but Washington, July 31st. To Hannah E. M. Stanton, Secretary of War. Sir, the cavalry expedition I directed General King to send out on the 19th instant has returned. They left Fredericksburg at 7 p.m. on the 19th, and after a forced march during the night made a descent at daylight in the morning upon the Virginia Central Railroad at Beaver Dam Creek, 25 miles north of Hanover Junction and 35 miles from Richmond. They destroyed the railroad and telegraph line for several miles, burned the depot, which contained 40,000 rounds of musket ammunition, 100 barrels of flour, and much other valuable property, and brought in the captain in charge as a prisoner. The whole country round was thrown into a great state of alarm. One private was wounded on our side. The cavalry marched 80 miles in 30 hours. The affair was most successful and reflects high credit upon the commanding officer and his troops. As soon as full particulars are received, I will transmit to you the name of the commanding officer of the troops engaged. I am, sir, very respectfully, your obedient servant, John Pope, Major General Commanding. The above order was received with great gladness by the boys of the Harris Light, and Kilpatrick had just reasons to feel proud of his brave boys and their noble deeds. As we had done so well in this branch of business, it was natural for the commanding general to be looking out for more similar jobs for us, and indeed, they came. July 24th, Kilpatrick was again launched out with his men on another raid upon the Virginia Central Railroad, which this time we struck at Anderson Turnout. However, we did not reach the railroad before we had surprised a camp of rebel cavalry with which we had a sharp skirmish on the south bank of the North Anna River but having the advantage of the enemy, we defeated them, captured their camp with several prisoners and horses. A large quantity of camp and garrison equipage fell into our hands, which we burned. Unfortunately for us, we did not come just in time to take the cars, but we created an alarm quite as extensive as that which prevailed at Beaver Dam on our former visit. The Richmond Examiner, commenting upon the affair, gave the following truthful rendering. 
When the train from the west on the Central Railroad reached Frederick's Hall, a station fifty miles from this, it was met by a rumor that the Yankee cavalry had made another raid from Fredericksburg and had possession of the track at Anderson Turnout, ten miles below Beaver Dam, and thirty miles from Richmond. The telegraph wire not being in working order, there was no means at hand of ascertaining the truth of this report. Under the circumstances, the conductor, not choosing to risk the passengers and train, took an extra locomotive and ran down to Anderson's on a reconnaissance, when he reached this place, he found the report of the Yankees at that point correct, but they had left several hours previous to his arrival. He learned the following particulars. At a quarter past nine a.m., just a quarter of an hour after the passage of train from Richmond, the Yankee cavalry, several hundred in number, made their appearance at the turnout. Having missed the train, they seemed to have no particular object in view, but loitered about the neighborhood for a couple of hours. They, however, before taking leave, searched the house of Mr. John S. Anderson, which is near the railroad, and took prisoner his son, who is in the Confederate service, but at home on sick furlough. They also took possession of four of Mr. Anderson's horses. They made no attempt to tear up the railroad, having no doubt had enough of that business at Beaver Dam last Sunday. They did not interfere with the telegraph wire through prudential motives, shrewdly guessing that any meddling with that would give notice of their presence. Of the movements of our troops occasioned by this second impudent foray, it is unnecessary to say anything. The central train reached this city at eight o'clock, three hours behind its usual time. It is evident that we are greatly embarrassing the rebel traveling public by our raids, destroying public property, capturing prisoners and horses, and gaining some valuable information. We have learned from contrabands and other sources that rebel forces in considerable numbers are being transported westward over this route. Some grand movements are undoubtedly on foot. We have received word that on the 14th General John P. Hatch, with all his cavalry, was ordered by General Banks to proceed at once upon Gordonsville, capture the place and destroy all the railroads that center there, but especially to make havoc of the Central Road, as far east as possible, and west to Charlottesville. For some reason, General Hatch was too slow in his movements, and General Ewell, with a division of Lee's army, reached the place on the 16th, one day ahead of Hatch. Thereupon, Hatch was ordered to take from 1,500 to 2,000 picked men, well-mounted, and to hasten from Madison Courthouse over the Blue Ridge and destroy the railroad westward to Staunton. He commenced the movement, but after passing through the narrow defiles of the mountains at Swift Run Gap, he felt that there was no hope of accomplishing anything, and returned. General Pope immediately relieved him from command and appointed General John Buford, General Banks' chief of artillery, in his place. After some months had elapsed, the following correspondence between General Hatch and his former command will partly vindicate, if it does not fully justify, his course. 2nd Cavalry Brigade, 3rd Army Corps near Fort Scott, Vars, 1862, to Brigadier General John P. Hatch. General, the accompanying saber is presented to you by the officers of the 1st Vermont and 5th New York Cavalry. We have served under you while you commanded the cavalry in Virginia, a period of active operations and military enterprise, during which your courage and judgment inspired us with confidence, while your zeal and integrity have left us an example easier to be admired than imitated. We, who have passed with you beyond the Rapidan and through Swift Run Gap, are best able to recognize your qualities as a commander. Accept, therefore, General, this testimonial of esteem offered long after we were removed from your command, when the external glitter of an ordinary man ceases to affect the mind, but when real worth begins to be appreciated. On behalf of the officers of the 5th New York, Robert Johnstone, Lieutenant Colonel, 5th New York Cavalry. To the officers of the 5th New York and 1st Vermont Regiments of Cavalry, Oswego, N.Y., 1862. Gentlemen, a very beautiful saber, your present to myself, has been received. I shall wear it with pride, and will never draw it but in an honorable cause. 
the very kind letter accompanying the saber has caused emotions of the deepest nature. The assurance it gives of the confidence you feel in myself, and your approval of my course when in command of Banks's cavalry, is particularly gratifying. You, actors with myself in those stirring scenes, are competent judges as to the propriety of my course when it unfortunately did not meet with the approval of my superior, and your testimony, so handsomely expressed, after time has allowed opportunity for reflection, more than compensates for the mortification of that moment. I have watched with pride the movements of your regiments since my separation from you. When a telegram has announced that, in a cavalry fight, the edge of the saber was successfully used and the enemy routed, the further announcement that the 1st Vermont and 5th New York were engaged was unnecessary. Accept my kindest wishes for your future success. Sharp sabers and a trust in Providence will enable you to secure it in the field. Your obedient servant, John P. Hatch, Brigadier General. On the 5th of August, we were again sent out on a reconnaissance to the Central Railroad, which we struck on the 6th, about 10 o'clock a.m., at Fredericks Hall. The depot, which contained large supplies of commissary and quartermaster stores, was burned. The telegraph office was also destroyed with considerable length of weir, while the railroad track was torn and otherwise injured, principally by the fires we built upon it. In a factory near the station were found huge quantities of tobacco. The men took as much as the jaded condition of their horses would permit, and the remainder was wrapped in flames. All this was accomplished without loss on our side. These daring and successful raids made Kilpatrick very conspicuous before the army and country. He was complimented by the general commanding both in orders and by telegraph, and his name became a synonym of courage and success. This gave wonderful enthusiasm to his men, and their devotion to him was unbounded. Wherever he led us we gladly went, feeling that however formidable the force or dangerous the position we assailed, either by main force we could overcome, or by stratagem or celerity we could escape. This gave our young hero a double power. August 8th Today Kilpatrick was ordered with his regiments to reconnoiter in the direction of Orange Courthouse. We advanced by way of Chancellorsville and Old Wilderness Tavern, but on approaching the courthouse we found it occupied by a heavy force of the enemy. It is evident that the rebel army is advancing with a show of fight towards the upper fords of the Rapidan, where, we understand, Generals Buford and Bayard are picketing. After ascertaining all we could about present and prospective movements, we returned to our old camp, having made a swift and tedious march. On the ninth was fought the memorable Battle of Cedar or Slaughter's Mountain, in which both sides claimed the victory. The Confederates certainly had the advantage of position, having taken possession of the wooded crest before the arrival of our advance, and they also greatly outnumbered the Union force. But their loss was nearly double our own, and nearly the same ground was occupied by the combatants at night, which each held in the beginning of the fight. The cavalry was not conspicuously engaged in this bloody fray, except such portions of it as were escort or bodyguard to officers in command, and among these some were killed. The main cavalry force watched the flanks doing good service there. August 10th At an early hour of the day the Harris Light was ordered to report at Culpeper Courthouse, and we were soon on the march. On arriving at our destination we found the place well-nigh filled with our wounded from the battle of yesterday, it is estimated that not less than fifteen hundred of our men were killed and wounded, about a thousand of the latter having found a refuge here. The seventh part of the casualties of a battle, on an average, will number the killed and mortally wounded. The others claim the especial attention of their comrades. It is heart-sickening to witness their bloody mangled forms. All the public buildings and many private residences of this village are occupied as hospitals, and the surgeons with their corps of hospital stewards and nurses are doing their work, assisted by as many others as have been detailed for this purpose or volunteer their services. The rebel wounded who have fallen into our hands receive the same attention that is bestowed upon our own men, 
many of them acknowledging that they are far better off in our care than they would be among their confederates. These hospitals are all much more quiet than one would naturally suppose. How calmly the brave boys endure the wounds they have received in defense of their beloved country. Only now and then can be heard a subdued sob or a dying groan, while those who are fully conscious, though suffering excruciating pain, are either engaged in silent prayer or meditation, or reading a testament or a last letter from loved ones, and patiently awaiting their turn with the surgeon or nurse. In the most available places, tables have been spread for the purpose of amputations. We cannot approach them with their heaps of mangled hands and feet, of shattered bones and yet quivering flesh, without a shudder. A man must need the highest style of heroism willingly to drag himself or be borne by others to one of these tables to undergo the processes of the amputating blade. But thanks be to modern skill in surgery and to the discoverer of chloroform, for by these aids operations are performed quickly and without the least sensation until the poor brave awakes with the painful consciousness of the loss of limbs, which no artificer can fully replace. Thus the skill displayed and the care taken greatly mitigate the horrors of battle. Men here are wounded in every conceivable manner, from the crowns of their heads to the soles of their feet, while some are most fearfully torn by shells. It had been thought that men shot through the lungs or entrails were past cure, yet several of the former have been saved, and not a few of the latter. Indeed, it would seem as though modern science was measuring nearly up to the age of miracles. We found that a large force of cavalry was concentrating at Culpeper, awaiting new developments. Reconnaissances are of frequent occurrence, and all of them reveal that the enemy is in motion, concentrating on our front. Our picket lines are made doubly strong, and the utmost vigilance is enjoined. Scouts and spies are on the rampage, and more or less excitement prevails everywhere. August 16th. Today a small detachment of cavalry under Colonel Broadhead of the 1st Michigan Cavalry was dispatched on a scout in the direction of Louisa Courthouse. Having penetrated to within the enemy's lines, and not far from the courthouse, they made a swift descent upon a suspicious-looking house, which proved to be General Stewart's headquarters. The general barely escaped through a back door, as it were, by the skin of his teeth leaving a part of his wardrobe behind him. His belt fell into our hands, and several very important dispatches from General Lee. Stewart's adjutant general was found concealed in the house and captured. General Pope, in his official reports, speaks of this affair as follows. The cavalry expedition sent out on the 16th in the direction of Louisa Courthouse captured the adjutant general of General Stewart and was very near capturing that officer himself. Among the papers taken was an autograph letter of General Robert E. Lee to General Stewart, dated Gordonsville, August 15th, which made manifest to me the disposition and force of the enemy and their determination to overwhelm the army under my command before it could be reinforced by any portion of the army of the Potomac. Had it not been for the timely discovery of this rebel order, General Pope's army, only a handful to the multitudes which were gathering against him from the defenses of Richmond, would have been flanked and probably annihilated. Assured, however, that reinforcements from McClellan's army could certainly reach him before long, General Pope held his advanced position to the last, our pickets guarding the fords of the Rapidan. On the 18th, the entire force of cavalry relieved the infantry pickets, and evident preparations were being made for a retreat. On the day following, a sharp skirmish took place with rebel cavalry which appeared across the narrow, rapid river. In this engagement, Captain Charles Walters, of the Harris Light, was killed, and his remains were interred at midnight, just as orders were received to retreat on the road to Culpeper. The cavalry under General Bayard is acting as the rear guard to our retreating columns. Stuart's cavalry, with whom we are engaged at almost every step, is the vanguard of the rebel army which is advancing as rapidly as possible. The prospect before us is exceedingly dark. Nothing is more discouraging to a soldier than to be compelled to retreat, especially under a general whose first order on assuming command contained the following utterances. Meantime, 
I desire you to dismiss from your minds certain phrases which I am sorry to find much in vogue among you. I hear constantly of taking strong positions and holding them, of lines of retreat and of bases of supplies. Let us discard such ideas. The strongest position a soldier should desire to occupy is one from which he can most easily advance against the enemy. Let us study the probable lines of retreat of our opponents and leave our own to take care of themselves. Let us look before and not behind. Success and glory are in the advance. Disaster and shame lurk in the rear. We all felt that the moment we begin to turn our backs to the enemy, that moment we acknowledge ourselves either outgeneraled or whipped, a thing most disheartening and to which pride never easily condescends. Our only hope was based on early reinforcements. Should these fail us, we saw nothing but defeat and disaster in our path. August 20th While our cavalry forces were feeding their horses on the large plains near Brandy Station, about six o'clock this morning, a heavy column of Stuart's cavalry was discovered, approaching from the direction of Culpeper. Kilpatrick was ordered to attack and check this advance, which he did in a spirited manner. The Harris Light added fresh laurels to its already famous record and made Brandy Station memorable in the annals of cavalry conflicts. Stuart's advance was not only retarded but diverted, and it was made our business to watch closely his future movements. On the 21st, we reached Freeman's Ford on the Rappahannock, which we picketed, preventing the enemy from effecting a crossing. As the fords of the river were generally heavily guarded up to this point, the enemy kept moving up the stream toward our right, evidently designing to make a flank movement upon us. On the 22nd, a notable cavalry engagement with light artillery took place at Waterloo Bridge. During this fight, a rebel shell took effect in our ranks, killing instantly three horses ridden by three officers of the same company, dismounting the gallants very unceremoniously but injuring no one seriously. Through the darkness of the night following, Stuart, with about 1,500 picked cavalrymen, effected a crossing of the river, and after making quite a detour via Warrenton, came down unperceived through the intense darkness and the falling rain upon General Pope's headquarters near Catlett's Station. He captured the General's field quartermaster and many important documents, made great havoc among the guards, horses, and wagons, and finally escaped, without injury to himself. With about three hundred prisoners and considerable private baggage taken from the train. His victory was indeed a cheap one, but we all felt its disgrace, which the darkness to some extent explained, but did not fully excuse. August 23rd. A severe contest occurred today at Sulphur Springs. The enemy is pressing us hard at every crossing of the river and continues to move towards our right. Skirmishing occurs at nearly every hour of the day and night, occasioning more or less loss of life. Yesterday, in a skirmish led by General Siegel, who had crossed the river, General Bolin was killed, and our forces driven back to the north side of the river. While this maneuvering was in progress along the Rappahannock, General Lee had dispatched Stonewall Jackson to pass around our right, which he did by crossing about four miles above Waterloo, and on the 25th, he struck our forces at Bristow Station, where a severe contest took place, the losses in killed and wounded being heavy on both sides. But the enemy was successful in taking possession of the railroad, and in the evening a portion of Stuart's cavalry, strengthened by two regiments of infantry, advanced to Manassas Junction, where they surprised and charged our guards, capturing many prisoners, also ten locomotives, seven trains loaded with immense quantities of stores, horses, tents, and eight cannons. They destroyed what they could not take away. The rebel general Ewell, having followed closely in the track of Jackson, also came upon the railroad in the rear of General Pope's army. Our commander, greatly astonished at this embarrassing juncture of affairs, began to make the best disposition of his forces to extricate himself from the toils that had been carefully laid for him, still hoping that new forces would come to his aid from McClellan's army via Alexandria. But hope in this instance availed him nothing, 
and he was compelled to encounter the immense rebel hosts, not only massed on his front but also lapping on his flanks, and penetrating, as we have seen, even to his rear. The situation was critical in the extreme, and had not the available forces behaved themselves with undaunted courage and, at times, with mad desperation, the disaster would have been unprecedented. Several unimportant and yet hotly contested battles were fought at Sulphur Springs, Thoroughfare Gap, Bristow Station, etc., and early on the morning of the 29th commenced the Battle of Groveton, by some called the Second Bull Run. The rebels were in overwhelming numbers, though driven badly during the earlier hours of the day, and had Fitzjohn Porter brought his forces into the action, the victory must have been ours. The cavalry, though quiet most of the day, made an important charge in the evening. The carnage had been terrible, and the fields were strewn with the dead and dying. It is estimated that the casualties would include not less than 7,000 men on our side alone, and it is fair to suppose that the enemy has lost not less than that number. August 30th, our lines having fallen back during the night, the battle was renewed today on the field of the first bull run. But the fates were again against us, and, though not panic-stricken, our men retired from the field at night until they rested themselves on the heights of Centerville. The enemy pursued us with great caution, not attempting even to cross Bull Run. On the 31st, General Pope expected to be attacked in his strong position at Sunterville, but the enemy was too cautious to expose himself in a position so advantageous to ourselves, where the repulse of Malvern Hill might have been repeated. Quiet reigned along our entire line during the day. September 1st. Becoming aware that a flank movement was in operation, General Pope started his entire army in the direction of Washington. But his army had not proceeded far before one of his columns, which had been sent to intercept the Little River Turnpike near Chantilly, encountered Stonewall Jackson, who had led his weary yet intrepid legions entirely around our right wing, and now contested our farther retreat. General Isaac J. Stevens, commanding General Reno's 2nd Division, who led our advance, at once ordered a charge and moved with terrible impetuosity upon the foe. But he was shot dead, on the very start, by a bullet through his head. His command was thereupon thrown into utter disorder, uncovering General Reno's 1st Division, which was also demoralized and broken. Just at this critical moment, General Philip Kearney, who was leading one of General Heintzelman's divisions, advanced with intrepid heart and unfaltering step upon the exultant foe. This was during a most fearful thunderstorm, so furious that with difficulty could ammunition be kept at all serviceable, and the roar of cannon could scarcely be heard a half dozen miles away. The rebel ranks recoiled and broke before this terrible bolt of war. Just before dark, while riding too carelessly over the field and very near the rebel lines, Kearney was shot dead by one of the enemy's sharpshooters. His command devolved upon General Burney, who ordered another charge, which was executed with great gallantry, driving the enemy from the field and defeating the great flanker in his attempts farther to harass our retreating columns. But our success had been dearly bought. Two generals had been sacrificed, and Kearney especially was lamented all over the land. Of him the poet sings, Our country bleeds with blows her own hands strike. He starts, he heeds her cries for succor. In a foreign land he dwells, his bowers with luxury's pinions fanned, his cup with roses crowned. He dashes down the cup, he leaves the bowers, he flies to aid his native land. Out leaps his patriot blade. Quick to the van he darts. Again the frown of strife bends blackening. Once again his ear war's furious trump with stern delight drinks in. Again the battle bolt in red career. Again the flood, the frenzy, and the din. At tottering Williamsburg his granite front bears without shock the battle's fiercest brunt. So have we seen the crag beat back the blast, so has the shore the surges backward cast. Behind his rock the shattered ranks reform forward still forward, until dark defeat burns to bright victory. 
Fame commands the song, we yield it gladly, but the glow fades as we sing. The dire, the fatal blow fell, fell at last. Full, full in deadliest front leading his legions, leading as his wont, the bullet wafts him to his mortal goal, and not alone war's thunders saw him die. Amid the glare, the rushing, and the roll, glared, crashed, the grand dread battle of the sky. There on two pinions, wars and storms, he soared flight how majestic, up, his dirge was roared not warbled, and his pall was smoke and cloud, flowers of red shot, red lightnings strewed his bier, and night, black night, the mourner. Now farewell, O hero, in our glory's pantheon. Thy name will shine, a name immortal one, by deeds immortal, in our heart's deep heart. Thy statued fame, that never shall depart, shall tower the loftier as time fleets and show. How heaven can sometimes plant its titans here below. Chapter 6 Rebel Invasion of Maryland By the almost continual fighting of General Pope's campaign, our ranks had been greatly depleted. Of the cavalry in general, one correspondent makes the following remark. They picket our outposts, scout the whole country for information, open our fights, cover our retreats, or clear up and finish our victories, as the case may be. In short, they are never idle, and rarely find rest for either men or horses. We had felt the influence of this wear and tear so sadly that our once full and noble regiment was now reduced to about three hundred and fifty men, scarcely one-third of our original number. Nearly every regiment of cavalry which had participated in the misfortunes of the campaign had suffered a like decimation. To replenish our weakened ranks and to infuse new vigor and discipline into the various commands became a question of no little moment. Consequently, a large number of regiments, under the direct supervision of General Bayard, were ordered to Halls Hill, about ten miles from Washington, where we established camps of instruction and drill. During the disasters of the Peninsular Campaign, and the subsequent defeats and retreats from the Rapidan to the Potomac, the country had awakened to the importance of increasing the army by new organizations and of filling up the broken ranks by fresh levies of recruits. This feeling was greatly intensified by the exposure of Washington to the victorious and advancing enemy, and by the invasions of northern soil, which the triumphs of the rebellion made imminent. Hence, Multitudes of recruits were pouring into Washington principally, and into other places, gladly donning the uniform and eager to learn the duties of the soldier. Camps of instruction were, of course, necessary. And as the attention of young men was turning very favorably to the cavalry service, our camps at Halls Hill were the scenes of daily arrivals of fine specimens of patriots, whose hands were warmly grasped by us and gladly we initiated them into the mysteries of this new science. We were not a little elated at the epithet of veteran, which these recruits lavished upon us. The experiences and labors of our old camps, Oregon and Sussex, were repeated with somewhat of new combinations and interests, as we sought to prepare ourselves and others more thoroughly than before to meet the foe in coming campaigns. We had scarcely reached our new camps and entered upon our new labors, when we learned that General Lee was marching his confident hosts into Maryland. This movement at first was regarded as a feint only, with the intention of uncovering Washington. But as column after column was known to have crossed the Potomac, and to be advancing through the state with more or less rapidity, the toxin of alarm was sounded everywhere, and a general movement was made to repel the invaders. Pennsylvania was thoroughly aroused, and her loyal and true governor issued a proclamation calling upon all the able-bodied men of the Commonwealth to organize for defense. The militia promptly responded to the call, and military preparations were going on, not only in the old Keystone State, but throughout the land. Up to this time, the attitude of the rebels had been defensive, but their recent great victories had led them to change their tactics and thinking that ultimate success was almost within their grasp, they now assumed the offensive policy. 
Aside from this consideration, they doubtless hoped to awaken in the border states a sympathy and an enthusiasm on their behalf, which thus far they had failed to create, and that their brilliant march northward would not only carry a strong political influence, but that their ranks would be greatly swollen by accessions of recruits from those states. This indication of rebel thought is evidently found in the address which General Lee issued to the people of Maryland on the 8th day of September. In it are found the following sentences. The people of the Confederate States have long watched with the deepest sympathy the wrongs and outrages that have been inflicted upon the citizens of a commonwealth allied to the states of the South by the strongest social, political, and commercial ties, and reduced to the condition of a conquered province. Believing that the people of Maryland possess a spirit too lofty to submit to such a government, the people of the South have long wished to aid you in throwing off this foreign yoke, to enable you again to enjoy the inalienable rights of freemen and restore the independence and sovereignty of your state. In obedience to this wish, our army has come among you and is prepared to assist you with the power of its arms in regaining the rights of which you have been so unjustly despoiled. But the fond hopes which prompted this address were destined to be blasted. Lee's advancing columns met no resistance, and marched directly upon Frederick City, where recruiting offices were opened under the superintendence of General Bradley T. Johnson, who had left this city at the beginning of the war to serve in the rebel army. But the Confederate chiefs were disappointed. The number who were marshaled under their stars and bars did not exceed the number of those who, tired of training in rebel gray, deserted their banner. The enemy's peaceful march through the state and its quiet possession were not of long duration, and the invaders soon found other work to do than to make political orders and harangues, and to increase their ranks by recruits. From Washington the Union Army began to advance with considerable strength and determination, compelling General Lee to relinquish his design of penetrating into Pennsylvania. Initiatory steps were now being taken for a great battle, the first encounter of which took place under General Pleasanton, who commanded our cavalry during this campaign, at the Catoctin Creek in Middletown, Maryland. The enemy's rear guard, consisting of cavalry, was struck with some force, the prelude of the Battle of South Mountain, at Turner's Gap. The enemy, having taken possession of this mountain pass, was driven from it only after the most obstinate resistance and severe loss, and forced to leave only before superior numbers. This occurred on the 14th, and the victory, though somewhat dearly bought, inspired our troops with new courage, and gave them a foretaste of better days. But during the day we have received sad tidings from Harper's Ferry, a point of no little importance to the invaders. Unfortunately for us the place was under the command of Colonel Miles, who, for his drunkenness and general incompetency, had made himself conspicuous during the first battle of Bull Run. Why such a man was left in command of at least ten thousand men, and at a place of so much interest, cannot well be accounted for. Aware, as he must have been several days ago, that this position was a coveted prize and would undoubtedly be assailed, he neither retreated nor fortified himself, as he easily could have done, to hold out for a long time against a superior force. Nothing but imbecility or treachery could have controlled his conduct. On the eleventh his command was increased largely by a force under General Julius White, who had evacuated Martinsburg on the approach of Stonewall Jackson. But today he was attacked from various positions, and his forces driven and on the 15th being attacked from at least seven commanding positions, early in the day the white flag was raised, which the enemy failing to see, continued to fire for several minutes, during which time Colonel Miles was killed, some say by a rebel shell, others assert by some of his own men. By this shameful surrender there fell into the hands of the enemy nearly twelve thousand men, half of them New Yorkers, who had just entered the service also seventy-three guns good and bad, thirteen thousand small arms, two hundred wagons, and a large supply of tents and camp equipage. Stonewall Jackson, who had commanded the expedition from Frederick to Harper's Ferry, now moved forward to join Lee's main army, which he did on the 16th. 
From South Mountain, General McClellan began to collect his forces well in hand and to move towards Boonesboro. Here, General Pleasanton again struck the rebel cavalry rear guard, capturing 250 prisoners and two field pieces. Infantry supports were following our cavalry very closely, and after marching about 12 miles, they discovered the rebels in force posted on the south bank of Antietam Creek, just in front of the little village of Sharpsburg. Our troops entered into bivouacs for the night, expecting to attack the enemy early next morning. But the morning and most of the day passed in idleness, while the rebels were fortifying their positions and gathering their forces which had been more or less scattered. Had McClellan ordered an advance that morning early, the 16th of September, 1862, would have witnessed a comparatively easy and complete victory. At 4 o'clock p.m., General Joseph Hooker was sent out on the right. Moving at a sufficient distance to keep out of sight of the rebel batteries, he forded the Antietam, and soon afterward turning sharply to the left, came down upon the enemy near the road to Hagerstown, but darkness soon coming on put a speedy end to the conflict. September 17th. This day has witnessed the grand and glorious battle of Antietam, the particulars of which I need not record. It is enough to say that the daring of our men and their heroic deeds upon this field wiped out forever in rebel blood, the disgrace and foul stain cast upon our arms in the momentous military blunders and defeats which have followed us since the beginning of this great American conflict. The losses were heavy on both sides, but the enemy was fairly beaten and driven from his chosen positions and night closed the most sanguinary day ever known to the American continent. McClellan ought to have followed up his victory early next morning, but hesitating, the enemy made good his escape across the Potomac, leaving only his dead and desperately wounded, the latter numbering about two thousand in our hands. October 4th. We are still in our camps at Hall's Hill, teaching and learning the tactics of war. Today Kilpatrick detailed me to act as drill master and gave me the command of a detachment of recruits. This gives me a new phase of army experience, and though it has its difficulties, as one will always find when he endeavors to control men of many minds, yet I find a good exercise of my little knowledge of human nature and realize that the influence of my new labor upon myself is very salutary. I had thought that I was master of all the preliminary steps of the science and art of a soldier's discipline, but in endeavoring to teach the same to others, I have learned so much myself that it now seems to me that what I knew before was the merest rudiment. This, I learn, is the experience of others who are engaged in similar work. Helping others has a wonderful reflex influence upon ourselves. I often wonder if this may not explain in part the philosophy of that passage of Holy Writ, which says, It is more blessed to give than to receive. In this exercise of drilling and in the comparative monotony of camp life, we spent the month of October. All was quiet along the entire lines of the great armies. Our ranks had been greatly swollen by new accessions, yet General McClellan was constantly calling for reinforcements and all kinds of supplies, alleging that the army was in no condition to move. At length, about the 26th of October, a feeble advance was made across the Potomac. Several days were spent in putting the Federal Army on the sacred soil and under marching orders. No opposition was encountered in the march. Our forces moved along the east side of the Blue Ridge, the enemy still occupying the Shenandoah Valley and moving southward on a line parallel with our own. November 2nd. The Harris Light broke camp at Halls Hill and advanced to the Chantilly Mansion, bivouacking on its beautiful grounds. This property is said to be owned by one of the Stuarts, who is reported to be a quartermaster general in the rebel service. Pleasant as was the place, with its fine walks, bordered with flowers and evergreen shrubbery, its fruitful gardens and groves, the cold of the night made our stay not the most agreeable. The next morning we pursued our line of march to Sudley Church, near Bull Run, where we encountered a strong force of Stuart's cavalry. After a sharp conflict, in which Yankee ingenuity and grit were fairly tested, 
the chivalry retired southwestwardly, acknowledging themselves badly defeated. November 4th. Today the regiment was ordered to move to Leesburg, near which we pitched our shelters. This is an old aristocratic village, the shire town of Loudoun County. It is situated in a lovely valley at the terminus of the Loudoun and Hampshire Railroad and is only about two miles from the Potomac and an equal distance from Goose Creek, which is a considerable stream. Though this county sent many brave men into the Union ranks, probably more than any other county of the same population in Virginia, yet Leesburg is almost a facsimile of Charlestown, the capital of Jefferson County, the scene of John Brown's execution, where all the people, including women and children, are secession to a man. All this while the Grand Army of the Potomac was moving southward at a snail's pace, and on the 7th of November, just after reaching Warrenton, General McClellan was relieved from command and directed to report to the authorities by letter from Trenton, New Jersey. Thus ended another indecisive campaign, which though it had witnessed a greater victory than ever won before, yet had failed to reap the fruits thereof. Chapter 7 McClellan succeeded by Burnside, upon General Ambrose. Burnside fell the choice of the executive for commander of the great Union Army. He assumed it with great reluctance and unfeigned self-distrust, and only as a matter of obedience to orders. This change in the commanding officer, deleterious and dangerous as it might be upon the morale of the army, was nevertheless considered necessary and expedient. Having secured by somewhat formidable forces the principal gaps or passages of the Blue Ridge, which had been occupied by the enemy since their advance into the valley, General Burnside began to make preparations to move his army to Fredericksburg, as being the most feasible and direct line from Washington to Richmond. To mask as long as possible his real design, he threatened an attack upon Gordonsville, but General Lee, by the aid of his emissaries and raiders, soon ascertained his plans and moving his army across the Blue Ridge through the western passes, he took his position on the south bank of the Rappahannock to prevent Burnside's crossing. November 8th. The Harris Light broke camp at Leesburg early in the morning and advanced to White Plains, where we encountered and defeated a detachment of rebel cavalry, driving them towards the mountains. Continuing our journey through this pleasant valley between the Blue Ridgey and the Bull Run Mountains, we soon joined our main army, whose headquarters were at Warrenton. This is the most beautiful village in this region of country, situated on the crest of fruitful hills and elegantly laid out. It is the shire town of Fauquier County. Here a few days were consumed in effecting the alterations incident upon a change of commander, and on the 14th, the Army of the Potomac was constituted into three corps and divisions, to be commanded respectively by Generals Sumner, Franklin, and Hooker. The following day, Warrenton was abandoned, and the army swept down towards the Rappahannock. The sight was a grand one. On our march, orders were received from President Lincoln enjoining a stricter observance of the Sabbath in the army and navy than had been done before. As a general thing, the Sabbath had not been regarded as any more than any other day. Indeed, very few men in the rank and file kept any calendar of time, and seldom knew the date or day. This was occasionally the case even with officers. The only possible way of keeping pace with flying time in the army is by writing a diary. But even when it was known that the Sabbath had been reached, no regard was taken of its sacred character. One of the causes of our disaster at the first battle of Bullbun was supposed by many to be that we had desecrated the holy Sabbath by our attack. However true or false such a view may have been, the order we received today from Washington was universally felt to be opportune. Two days' march brought our advance to Falmouth, and on the 21st General Patrick, our provost marshal general, was directed to repair to Fredericksburg under a flag of truce and request the surrender of the city. The authorities replied that while its buildings and streets would no longer be used by rebel sharpshooters to annoy our forces across the river, its occupation by Yankee troops would be resisted to the last. Had the means of crossing the river been at hand, 
General Burnside would have made hostile demonstrations at once, but through some misunderstanding between himself and General Halleck at Washington, the pontoons were not in readiness. November 28th. A strong force of rebel cavalry under General Wade Hampton dashed across the river at some of the upper fords, raided up around Dumfries and the Occoquan, captured several prisoners and wagons, and returned to their side of the river without loss. As a sort of offset to this, on the 29th, General Julius Stahel, who commanded a brigade of cavalry at Fairfax Courthouse, commenced an expedition of great daring and success to the Shenandoah Valley. Having advanced to Snickers Gap in the Blue Ridge, a strong rebel picket post was captured by our vanguard. Pressing forward on the main thoroughfare, they soon reached the Shenandoah River and were not a little annoyed by rebel carboneers hidden behind old buildings across the stream. Captain Abram H. Crome, commanding a detachment of the 5th New York Cavalry and leading the advance, dashed across the river, though deep and the current swift, closely followed by his men. On reaching the opposite bank, a charge was ordered and executed in so gallant a manner that several rebels were made prisoners and the remainder of the squad was driven away at a breakneck speed. Our men pursued them in a scrambling race for nearly three miles when they came upon a rebel camp, which was attacked in a furious manner. Our boys made music enough for a brigade, though only a squadron was at hand. The enemy attempted a defense, but utterly failed. Reinforcements coming to our aid, the rebels were thoroughly beaten and driven away, leaving in our hands one captain, two lieutenants, thirty-two privates, one stand of colors, and several wagons and ambulances. Most of these were laden with booty taken by White's guerrillas in a recent raid into Poolsville, Maryland. Sixty horses and fifty heads of cattle were also captured in this gallant charge. With all their spoils, the expedition returned via Leesburg, arriving at their camps in safety 